Thank you, Donna. And thank you, everyone, for coming back in. Um, I believe, is this not known as the graveyard slot? You've all had a lovely dinner, hopefully. Filled your tummies, and now you're going to go to sleep. That's fine, because I can't actually see if you do. So, um, so, there we are. As I'm sure some of you have already experienced, it can be very hard to swallow at times. Um, as I sat here this morning listening to the previous speakers, there was a tendency to think, oh, they're mentioning posture, they're mentioning breathing, all these things that come to challenge us for different reasons. But then I thought, actually, yes, they may be coming from slightly different causes, but lots of the remediations are similar. And so it will help. I'm going to talk about good breathing, good posture, exercising as well. Uh, so while we're doing it for one thing, it will be benefiting another. Also, my aim is to hopefully, in the next little while, inform you about swallowing, how it works, the mechanism, and give you some ideas that might help in the way that I hope will be supportive. There aren't any easy answers. You've heard that before today as well. And quite a lot of what I'm saying is anecdotal. That means it's come from surveys of people with these various conditions, both in the UK, in the States, and occasionally from other countries. Because, as Lisa said, there is even less research, probably, on swallowing in Ehlers-Danlos and hypermobility spectrum disorders. Swallowing itself in a study is a young science. Um, so, hopefully, we will learn about the normal swallow, try and understand some of the differences that have been reported, discuss how, if you go to a speech and language therapist or a radiologist, or other people involved in swallowing, how they may assess your swallowing, hopefully discuss some remediations and to talk about the voice and other remediations. So if you haven't already realized and worked out, swallowing is a very complicated neuromuscular activity. It's probably one of the most complicated activities that we do, but until it goes wrong, we all do it like we do breathing, without really thinking. And they reckon that about 5% of the population will have some sort of problem with swallowing. That's the mainstream population. Roughly one in eight people. So swallowing, we've got to protect as we swallow food and fluid, the airway. It's one of those times when I think nature quite often gets it really, really right, but you have to think about this airway and esophageal food tube connection. So while we're swallowing, we have to protect the airway to pre prevent food or fluid going into the lungs. So as I say, it's probably one of the most neuromuscularly complex things we do. And we do it in such a short time. If I said to you all now, OK, do a swallow, you'd probably all be sitting there going. But as we're eating and drinking, we do it so quickly. 22 pairs of muscles. Our head, face, and neck are just so full of muscles. And the cranial nerves, which come out from the brain to the top of the spinal cord, 12 of them regulate, if not all of the body functions, most of them. Seven of those 12 are involved in the swallowing mechanism. And here I'm going on to anatomy. That might not be totally clear. And you might think, well, why has she got everything on there? Because everything on that slide is involved in good swallowing. 
So you might think, well, okay, my nose is involved for smelling my food. And we all know if you've got a cold or your nose is bunged up, you don't really want to eat, but that's partly because you can't smell it, apart from the fact that you can't breathe either. Um, but in actual fact, the nose warms the air as we breathe in, which helps to begin the swallowing process. We've already heard and seen that for some people, they may have a very high, narrow palate. There may be crowding of teeth. All these things are needed. We need our lips to work properly, to form a lip seal. Otherwise, you get escape. We need our tongue, cheeks to work, um, as well as then the uh, organs at the back, the pharynx uh, in the esophagus. So I'm now going to hopefully show you a short animation of the actual swallowing process. The normal adult swallow is described in four different stages. The oral preparatory stage. Once the food is taken into the mouth, the lips form a tight seal which stops the food coming out. The cheeks keep the food central in the oral cavity. Food needs to be the right size and consistency to prepare for the act of swallowing. We do this by chewing to break the food down using our teeth and jaw. The tongue also moves around the mouth to mix saliva with the food and to form a cohesive bolus. the oral stage. At this point, the bolus sits in the central part of the tongue, ready to be propelled backwards through the oral cavity. This is achieved by the tip of the tongue elevating and the middle of the tongue pressing the bolus towards the hard palate, the roof of the mouth, stripping the bolus against the palate. The bolus is propelled smoothly backwards towards the pharynx. The pharyngeal stage. At this point, the swallow is involuntary. We have no control over the swallow. The soft palate raises to prevent food going up through the nose. The bolus is squeezed through the pharynx. The airway needs to be closed off to prevent food material entering the lungs and to allow food to pass to the stomach. At this point, breathing is halted. This is a very quick stage, lasting a second or less. The esophageal stage. The esophagus relaxes, allowing passage of food into the stomach. A peristaltic movement pushes the bolus through the esophagus. This is a slower, involuntary process, lasting approximately eight seconds in an adult. There is a valve at the bottom of the esophagus that allows the bolus to move into the stomach. This is the end of the action of swallowing. Seeing that, you can begin to understand that if laxity of ligaments means lifting the larynx the is going statements. to be difficult or delayed, if the tongue movements aren't going to be quickly initiated or strong enough, you can begin to see already areas where the swallow just might not go as smoothly as you would like. So there we are, the stages. It is said that if we're about to swallow, we actually breathe in and breathe out and then stop breathing. And that is a good sign but as the animation says and also as we all know we can do if we need to breathe we tend to hold the solid and the bolus in our mouth it's much harder if not impossible with fluid so how is swallowing assessed visual clinical assessment and 
you all know, if you swallow, your larynx lifts up and slightly forward. The laryngeal ligaments, the hyoid bone, pull it forward. So there's also allowing for the breathing, the sounds of swallowing. So with a stethoscope, a speech therapist can hear what you're doing with breathing, can hear what you're doing in your mouth, whether you're preparing the bolus, whether you're breathing over the top of the bolus, that sort of thing. And then, and for those of you of a certain age, if I say clunk, click, as you actually swallow, there is a definite clunk, click uh, sound. The other thing is that you may not realize, but we actually have two sides to our pharynx. So it may be that one side is much stronger for swallowing than the other. And that is useful for remediation purposes. But again, somebody assessing will be able to discover whether that is the case. Pulse oximetry, you've probably all had a pulse oximeter monitor put on your finger. Again, this is early stages, but the research is beginning to show that if while somebody swallows, their oxygen sats drop by 5% or more and take several minutes to come back up again, then that could also indicate a difficulty with swallowing. And video fluoroscopy, I'm sure, and almost hope in a way, that some of you who have got swallowing issues that have been identified have actually had video fluoroscopy x-ray studies carried out. Fiber endoscopic esophageal screening, known as FEES, it is beginning to be used more in the UK. Again, it's a nasal tube that's passed and the whole process is observed. Manometer, ultrasound, they're a bit old now. And I've put chest x-ray on because it's a sign that sometimes can be missed, but if you are having recurrent chest infections and the radiograph shows that you've got white in the bottom of your right lung, but your left lung is clear, then that's also something that needs following up. So why do we get dysphagia? I've touched on some already. Laxity of ligaments neurological dysfunction, muscle dysfunction, physical obstructions, and we can't rule those out just because there's a connective tissue uh, around. Infection and inflammation, it, again, it may be a passing phase, but as you can see, if the pharynx is inflamed, food might get stuck. And this is one that I think is really significant for people with connective tissue problems. Fatigue and timing and also perceptual dysfunction. If the sensors that give the feedback to the brain that the bolus, the food is prepared, ready to swallow, are not sending back the right messages, then the brain can't organize to do the swallow. I'm really sorry, especially for the younger people, this is the case for the normal population. Aging in itself can lead to swallowing difficulties, as does dementia. Although to some extent with dementia, that's also the sort of psychological of losing the understanding that you need to sit and eat and want to eat. Acid reflux. Um, apart from the pain and the discomfort, it is now beginning to be thought that if you've got acid coming back up into your pharynx, the cricopharyngeal muscle, which is at the back of the pharynx in the laryngeal area, can actually be stimulated to contract. And that, people often will say, I've got a lump in my throat, or something gets stuck as it goes down. Now that might be because that cricopharyngeal muscle is not relaxing to let the food through. So it is an interesting thought that it could be acid coming up the other way. We've already spoken about acid reflux today. It happens. Unfortunately, we have rings of muscle in the GI tract at different places, hopefully to close things off. But again, if you've got laxity, they can open up. And the other one you might be surprised, or you might not, to see on the list, constipation in itself. The body almost seems to say, no, come on, you can't eat anymore till you've eliminated something. So, 
These are actually reported symptoms from people who completed my surveys for me over the last 20 years or so. So if you did, many thanks. But the swallow doesn't start. So that's called delayed initiation. You're doing all the right things. You've moved your lips, you're moving your cheeks, the tongue, but the swallow just doesn't happen. This feeling of something being stuck, voice goes funny. If after you've swallowed, you've then got a bit of a gurgly voice or it sounds wet, that is suggestive that something has gone forward into the laryngeal area and when you've opened the larynx up for breathing again, it's gone the wrong way. I'm sure many of you will identify with this one. My hand goes up first. Chewing is hard work. A lump or a pain in your throat. Possibly the cricopharyngeus not relaxing. Other symptoms, drooling. If you've got poor lip closure, you will lose. I'm sure some of you have seen me drinking with a straw all the time because my lip closure is not good enough for a cup. Bits left in the mouth and the throat. Again, because the tongue and the cheeks aren't working quite properly, so debris can get left behind. And debris being left behind is quite significant, as you can think back to the animation. If you've got bits and pieces left here and you return to breathing, your airways open. And that is the same reason why, if you have got this feeling of lump in your throat, if it is a cricopharyngeal issue, it needs investigating. Because if your bolus or even part of it is getting stuck just there, when you return to breathing, it's just ready to be pushed in the wrong direction. Uh, weight loss also due to poor intake. Um, and as I touched on earlier, recurrent chest infections, particularly if there isn't other, you know, temperature and other issues to think this is a virus. Obviously, hunger and thirst. And again, these are things that people both in EDS UK and HMSA have reported, not wanting to eat in public not wanting to eat when alone. Quite a few people said, I would never ever think of eating or drinking if I'm in the house on my own. Um, and then choking. We touched on the delayed triggering, this thing that the swallow just doesn't start. That can sometimes be because it, the bolus going through the mouth is slowed and so the brain message is delayed. Touched on the residue in the pharynx. And then another one is the slowed esophageal transit. That would definitely be ENT GI tract investigation. So I've touched on some of the causes. And I almost feel like sort of Job's comforter up here, you know, going through the list of possibilities, laxity of ligaments, slippage of cervical vertebrae, Chiari malformation, tethered cord, Disordered functioning of muscles and ligaments. Tongue movements, I've said, tiring. So preparing and chewing the food is not as it needs to be. And I am not in any way belittling when I put temporomandibular joint issues in itself. If you've got pain, stiffness, all the problems we associate with TMJ issues, then again, your swallow is at risk of needing help. Aging I've touched on and hormonal fluctuations. Not to leave gents out, but probably more a feminine issue. Um, I spent my working life working with children and adults with rare neurological developmental progressive disorders. And over the decades as it was, we suddenly realized we had Young ladies whose swallow was fine, except for one week in the month. And in those weeks, we had to do alternative root feeding because the swallow just wasn't there. And we could only put that down to an increase in laxity of ligaments and muscles, just not 
pulling it up. As a bit of an aside, just in case, because some of you will have children who may be having difficulties or who have managed to a certain age and then suddenly have difficulty. As babies and infants, we have what they call an immature swallow. It's suck, swallow, suck, swallow. As we mature, and certainly for children normally, the mature swallow would come in sooner than this, but there is a slight change in the anatomy at the back of our mouths to allow for the fact that we go from suck, swallow to suck, chew, swallow. And again, the possibility that as that change goes, the ana anatomical change happens, the tongue and everything else just can't cope with the different space. So somebody who appeared to have a reasonable swallow might suddenly have difficulty. The other thing just to touch on for the hormonal fluctuations, again, I'm really sorry, is that I touched on it earlier, the sphincters become looser. So if you're prone to reflux, then again, not only might the swallow become more problematic, but the sphincter's looser, so the reflux will get worse during that time. Now, you've already heard about Dr. Marco Castori. <laughs> there is very little research out there, but one of Marco's papers gives us some. Thinking back, I said 5% of the population, one in eight. To some extent, these figures begin to speak for themselves. 14 out of 21, that's 60%, uh, reported gastritis, 12 out of 21, reflux, 18 out of 21, dysphonia. I am going to touch on dysphonia, inability to create or make or maintain voice, um, and hearing loss as well. I'm not really touching on the hearing loss itself, um, although... Obviously, to produce good voice, we actually need to hear both our own and other people's clearly. And here's another study, but I believe it's a lady, and she's part of Marco Castori's team. 25 out of 31 GI tract issues. And, oh no, sorry, that was Marco, and it's the developmental one, um, study of children with joint hypermobility syndrome and developmental coordination disorder, 14 out of 19, as children had atypical swallowing. Um, Marco and I have communicated over the last couple of years, as has Professor Aziz and myself, um, and some of the factors found in uh, hypermobility swallowing have come from some of his studies, but his study doesn't actually at the moment focus on the swallowing itself. Okay, I'm gonna skip through these because as other speakers have said, I'm around the rest of today and tomorrow. Oh, I'm adding to the medication concerns, <laughs> but they've been touched on already. You know, medications for blood pressure, um, nitrates, heart problems, cardiac drugs. If you can imagine any medication that is working by drying you up, because you need saliva to swallow well. Um, calcium channel blockers, angina. Um, I'm sad to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got vitamin C on the list. I will talk to you later about how that's thought to affect swallowing. Um, and there are other ones there. Baclofen and Botox. Muscle relaxant effect. So they are a bit of a two-edged sword. To some extent, they can help. But if your dose is wrong, then you will be in a worse state because you're too loose and too relaxed. Again, I worked with people who had Botox injections to help with their um, spasticity in their arms, but when they first had their injections, their swallows went off. It's the only way I can describe it. It's not very medical. But their swallows would go off for three or four days as it 
some, for, and this was guys as well, so it wasn't hormonal. Okay, so what can we do to help ourselves? Position. I don't know whether you've ever tried to swallow if you've turned to someone and you're talking. can make it harder. So, head forward, midline, chin slightly tucked in. Texture, softer, non-chewy foods, although I have reliably been informed over the years, mashed potato is a difficult uh, texture, as is white bread. It goes round and round. Um, and if you've got TMJ problems, I know it's hard again, it's a case of don't, but don't try not to become someone who wants to chew gum or toffee. If you must chew something, I think I'd go for the toffee, but don't tell the dentists that. Chewing gum, not only are you doing a repetitive movement, but if you've got reflux, when you chew gum, your stomach is saying, or your brain even is saying to stomach, you're about to get something to eat. Prepare some acid. So the more you chew the gum, nothing's going down, but your stomach is creating acid ready. So it's more of a, just protect yourself really. Um, if you've got a problem with food rushing through your mouth, then thicker texture. And if you have more of a problem swallowing fluids than solids, fine. You know, get these thick fruit juices. Find a way to, to thicken it a bit. I don't know, but a lot of people will say, I've got a sore throat, so I'm going to drink. We naturally think swallowing a fluid is easier than a solid. If you've got a slight problem with coordination, timing, whatever else, then a fluid is harder because you've got nothing to hold it in your mouth. And if you've got a timing problem, if your swallow takes a while to trigger, then it's gone through before your brain has said, I need to swallow. So, not saying you shouldn't have liquids, but be aware that they can be harder work. We've also heard little and often, tiring. And I, it can be tiring to think, oh, well, that means I've got to do the eating thing six times a day. But it, and it really is well known across the whole of the swallowing difficulty population. You may well have a swallow that works for 10 or 15 swallows, but as you tire, it will not work. So fine, use those 10 or 15 swallows, have a rest. I know I said keep your head down, but sometimes if you've got a problem with one side or the other, if you've got one side that doesn't work, then turning to close that side off while you're swallowing may be an answer. As you can see, swallowing difficulties have a lot of different possible causes. So there's a lot of different remediations. And this can only be general. And I do really strongly advise you, if you think you've got difficulties in this area, ask for a, an SLT referral, an assessment. Head down completely, two swallows. Um, head up, but only if it's been assessed as safe. Head up because gravity is helping carry the fluid and the bolus through. But because you've got your head up, your airway is open. So that's why I say it has to be assessed as a safe alternative. If it's not already, get the gastroesophageal reflux treated. Exercises. There's all sorts of compensatory maneuvers, exercises, and this is where I'm going to say to you, please look for them on YouTube. There's a, one called the Masako Technique, and these are more, some of them to be done while you're eating, some of them to be done away from eating, where you actually gently hold your tongue between your teeth but still try and make a swallow. There's something called the Shaker Movement, when you're lying flat, Gently lift your head up to look at your toes, but again, gently do it within your known safe limits. Lift up, look at your toes, do that a few times, rest, do it again. If your 
neck will allow that. The other thing I will just say, if you do manage to get to an SLT and she gives you exercises, my personal experience of any exercises, including exercises for the TMJ, anything that would be given to a mainstream person, so like if they say do this 30 times, divide it by three. Begin with that, because you may never get beyond that. But always reduce, if it's what would be given as a, a norm, start with a lot less. Build up if you can. And then there are other things like effortful swallow, um, the Mendelssohn maneuver, where you, as you're trying to swallow, you concentrate, you lift your larynx up, hold it, then swallow. But after you've swallowed, you concentrate on holding it up and then let it go. But like I say, there's all sorts of things. Um, and just dental hygiene, really, because we all need to keep hold of our teeth as long as possible. Um, again, personal experience. If you haven't got a bite, life is challenging. <laughs> personal experience. I haven't got a TMJ that side. But again, if you want to know what living with only one TMJ is like, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, we all know meat, biting foods. Again, because you open and then you you've put stress on this joint, which is a problem for so many of us. I've mentioned the bread and mashed potato. Mixed textures. So mulligatawny soup, soup with chunks in and then liquid because we don't manage the two consistencies together easily. Um, and I did just have, because I don't know, pills, swallowing some pills. And I was thinking about this, why can pills be so tricky? And I thought, because sometimes we go to them, we've got a glass of water, a pill, we're not eating. And you put the pill in and the water, and I just, and this is a pure conjecture, but haven't got the swallowing process going. And then I've got a mixed texture. I've got a fairly large pill and water. And I'm wondering why I'm... <coughs> so actually start doing some chewing movements, take a few mouthfuls of water before you try. Um, it just may help prepare. The other thing to do um, is ask the, pharmac ask the pharmacist. <laughs> if that particular medication comes in a different size pill. I was staggered a few weeks ago, actually. I, they changed the paracetamol I was being given, and I really struggled. And I mentioned that to the pharmacist, and he said, oh, well, I'll give you a different make. And they're just that little bit smaller. Made all the difference. Uh, it's always worth asking. So... From the swallowing point of view, yes, do look for swallowing techniques, remediations on Google, YouTube. Um, again, it's not going to be up there long, but Robert Bastian's site has a lot of stuff on dysphagia swallowing. Um, and there's one or two others up there, which if you want to come and see me, I'll, I'll give you. Okay, I'm going to rush on to voice problems. Some of it we have touched on. I don't think you need to be an anatomist to know or to have worked out that really it's the same structures coming into play again. And the same potential challenges if the ligaments are loose, if we've not got much energy and strength for breathing and filling our lungs. Because basically, voicing is the air coming up from our lungs at pressure through the vocal cords in the larynx and out. Same organs. So many of them. <laughs> and so many of them liable to playing up in connective tissue. You might be wondering, why has she put Again, nose, ears, and sinuses. Well, I touched on the ears. The sinuses, it's a remediation thing, really, in that partly to make our skulls lighter, but also to help with the resonance. There are spaces, and they're like resonance chambers. 
And so if they're full and bunged up, then you're not going to get the resonance. Um, but it's something that we can use to help ourselves. But I'll go into that a bit later. OK, so we don't perhaps always think about this, but, you know, I'm finding talking difficult. Well, it's the environment I'm in. It's really, really dry. Um, there's a lot of background noise. It may be pitch. And again, I'm, I'm really showing my age, aren't I? But our previous prime minister, when she first became PM, she had quite a high voice. And by the time she finished, because she had gone to voice training to lower her pitch. Using the right pitch is quite significant because then we're not straining the vocal cords. Um, volume demands, think about it. Think where you are. And you may well have to say to somebody, look, I'm sorry, I can't carry on this conversation here. Um, health and well-being in general, we all know if we're tired. Talking takes a lot of energy. Voice takes energy. Again, the posture comes in. You know, the same with swallowing. Think about your posture. Try and keep as upright as possible to give the lungs the best possible chance of having enough air. So hydration and humidity. We need humidity to get a good voice. This sounds like a, you know, put your hands out, I'll slap it, but I'm sorry, smoking and drinking comes up again. Um, it's not so bad, I don't think, these days, but there used to be something known as the gin voice. Um, because for some reason, gin in particular, I don't think the people were swallowing it the wrong way, but it seemed to aggravate and make a harsh voice. Psychological and emotional issues, and I really big one, not hysteria. It is not in your heads. Um, you're not just being hysterical. Um, if you haven't already, you will find that voice problems are something else that goes into the, oh, you're imagining it box. Um, I've touched on hormone fluctuations and energy levels. So, again, these are the two surveys I did. Youngsters who were reported to not be able to achieve a voice unless they were actually shouting until about the age of 10. 20 and 30 year olds reporting voice maintenance issues. So keeping a voice going over a length of time, keeping the volume going. Now, they are aging issues in themselves, but for 20 and 30 year old, that, that's far too young for aging itself to be the reason. Hormonal fluctuations, reflux, um, you may or may not know why I've put reflux. If you wake up in the morning and you've nearly always got a hoarse voice, then that could be reflux acid escaping into the larynx overnight. Um, tiring, I can feel mine. So, remediations. Pretend you're opera singers and actors. Do a warm-up session. Um, posture, core stability, all the other uh, things to do to help create better posture. Find the right pitch. Now, I mean, again, if you've got significant voice issues, SLT referral will help understand it more. But if you haven't and you want to find the right pitch, then sing up a scale you will soon begin to feel where it feels comfortable and where it starts to feel strained. Make sure you're in an appropriate environment. Keep yourself well hydrated. If you've got to talk for a length of time, take a bottle of water, sip. Use a volume level that you can manage that doesn't tire you. Same as everything else, really, little and often. Use the resonance, practice humming, you know, and try and talk into your resonance. Um, whatever you do, however tempting it is, use a full voice, not whisper. Because when you whisper, you're straining. I, again, it's a bit like the swallowing liquids. If you have a sore throat, you think, oh, well, I'll whisper, it won't hurt as much. And that's when ongoing voice problems can start. 
because you're whispering and you're using it wrongly. You're better to just not talk for a day or two. Um, exercises, breathing exercises, articulatory exercises, in small doses, they can all help. I assure you, if you have TMJ, pain and stiffness, it's so easy to think, I don't want to stretch it. I don't want to move it. Um, but keep it moving. Relaxation as well. Actually practice various techniques, whichever work for you, to make you feel relaxed. So if you're in a position where you are going to be a bit stressed with your voice, then you can sort of, at the background, be bringing in the relaxation technique. One thing I must say, whatever other diagnoses you might have, if you have ongoing hoarseness for up to three weeks without a cold, then get it looked at. Because again, like the swallowing issues, we're just as at risk of some of the other things that can happen to stop a voice coming out properly. So, um, again, with delayed articulation, again, practice. Practice putting two consonants together, three together, can help. And just the last thing, really, with the TMJ issues, physio can also help. It may be that they can help you with posture and increasing uh, neck stability. Because if you've got a wobbly neck, so she, you actually tend to hold yourself. And of course, the first place that gets the tightness is here. Um, and it may be they can do soft tissue work. Ultrasound can break down some of the tension. So physio for TMJ can also help. And again, what did we do before the internet? British Voice Association has lots of useful leaflets on positioning exercises, breathing, um, and also my professional body, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Right, I haven't left much time, if any, for questions, sorry. No, it's okay. But I am around. Yeah.